Also, um, we are, as you've just got a little pop-up screen, we are recording the session. So by remaining on the call, you're consenting to uh, any contribution that you make to the call. Uh, I think you'll appear if you uh, if you ask a question, the screen might pop to you and so forth. And that includes the um, the display of your name. Um, if you remain on the if you remain on the call, you're consenting to that being posted on the Canadian Outrigger uh, YouTube page. Okay, and uh, you won't receive any compensation for any contribution that you make. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, we've got Cheryl Scribe from Coma. Cheryl has uh, over 30 years of outrigger and coaching and um, uh, paddling experience. She has lived everywhere from uh, BC in the interior. She currently resides in Comox on the island. She has pa uh, paddled and raced in Hawaii and Australia. And we're very, very proud to, uh, to have her join us today to uh, take us through the ins and outs of uh, intermediate steering technique with all these little tips. Uh, so I'll uh, just hand it over to Cheryl. I'm going to pop in here, Ron, and also say Cheryl is a member of the Canadian Outrigger Racing Association's Hall of Fame as well. Oh, I, I was supposed to say that. I'm sorry, I forgot that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Leanne. <laughs> That's more pressure, I think. I think you've just put more pressure on me. <clears throat> okay, welcome, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here. Share all of my, well, not all, but as many as I can get through in the next hour of my 35 years of paddling and racing outrigger canoes. It's truly been a blessing for me and uh, it's changed my life. So I hope that um, through this adventure we're on in the next 90 minutes, we can uh, share some ideas and all make ourselves a little bit better. Okay, so for in the course of this, I'm gonna say steers person, I'm gonna probably say steers man, but I'm probably not gonna say steers woman. So if I offend anyone, I apologize. It's just the word that comes out. And uh, it's just the way it is. So for any of you who've been steering for a while, you know that this is an exercise in humility. And mostly because you just don't know what you don't know. So in order to figure out what you don't know, you generally have to make mistakes. And you have to make a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes generally come in front of everybody. So a really amazing quality for a steersman is to have thick skin. And we're going to learn about that as we go along, because I'm going to have a few war stories that really highlight this. So <clears throat> just, just take some solace in the fact that the more mistakes you make in the steering role, the better steersman that you're going to become. And um, uh, I don't know if you've heard the expression, uh, a, a stroke wins a race and a steersman loses the race. I, I truly, I truly don't believe a hundred percent in that, but I think in all of my years of paddling, I would say that there were times when as a steersman, I had my crew uh, at the mercy of, of that, of that finish line um, and what place it came at. So uh, sometimes I nailed it. Sometimes I didn't. Uh, but uh, in the end, my crew was stuck with me in that moment. And um what, oh, those moments when you know that you've made a mistake and it's cost you a lot, those are the ones that are going to stick with you the longest and the hardest. And, and I think that if, once again, if there's any solace in that is, is you will become a better steersman as a result of those big, terrible mistakes. Okay, so um, uh, Ron mentioned that this is an intermediate steering clinic and I would say that I'm going to try my best to stay to the intermediate intermediate level um, and but sometimes we're going to sneak into the advance and sometimes it's going to feel like maybe we're in the beginner but really we're going to kind of hover as much as we can in that intermediate level okay steering is a science and an art is what I felt I found over time so at first we're going to deal with the science part of it um, so every steer stroke you take creates drag on the canoe. So drag is the force that runs opposite to the direction that you are moving through the water. So like, let's take a minute to think about this. Every steer stroke you make creates drag. So essentially every steer stroke you take slows the canoe down. 
I mean, that's a big deal. So I think as you head into that intermediate stage and that expert stage of steering, you really have to commit that to your head every single time you steer, is that when you steer, you create drag and that drag slows the canoe down. So it's incredibly important that you are precise in how you choose to steer the canoe. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a few minutes and I'm gonna show you the basic steering strokes and um, they're gonna feel pretty basic, but I think they're vital to the rest of our conversation. So I've kind of got my little canoe set up here. Let's get this out of the way. <clears throat> okay, so here I am sitting in my canoe, got my paddling stroke here, my, my, my steering blade, top hand on the top. My very first option for steering is to push, it's called a poke, pushing our paddle stroke along the side of the canoe and hovering it there. That's a regular poke. Our second option is to then take our paddle and twist it. So take your top hand and twist it away from you. And the third one is to pull it in this direction. So those three options are more aggressive. Now, if you can believe it or not, like this, just putting your, stro your steer stroke on the side of the canoe creates enough drag to affect a 45 foot canoe sitting ahead of you. I mean, that's pretty, pretty amazing. That's a little bit more aggressive. This is really a, that, that much more aggressive. Your other steering stroke that you've got is what's called a standing draw. And it's when you place the paddle in the water, you grant purchase, and then it just sits there like that. I call that a goon stroke. And personally, I'm not a big fan of it, but there are times when it comes, comes handy. Your steering strokes, your paddling strokes, sorry, are any paddling that you do while you're, steer, while, while you're in the back, that's creating forward momentum, but not perfect forward momentum. So any angle that you create this way, this way, and this way. Now for any of you guys that have uh, attended my steering clinics, I'm pretty pedantic about making sure that that top hand is on the top of the blade when you're doing your steering blade, when you're doing your steering strokes. And the reason this is so important is because it gives you more leverage. Now, if you're doing a six hour race and you're trying to affect change with your hands like this, it's very hard to twist your paddle. It's very hard to leverage your paddle like that. But if you're up here, super easy to twist, super easy to leverage, and it takes a lot less toll on you. Plus, way more easy to switch to the other side. So I'll just show you that. One, two, three. Now, as basic as this sounds, this is gold, you guys. It is absolutely gold. If you don't have these three steering strokes down, then you are going to struggle. And you're going to see a video a little bit later, and you're going to see why this is so important. Now, as far as angles and hand positions are, I'm, I'm going to be, okay, so when I was doing my sprint paddling, I would generally swap with my team. So every time there was a hot hoe, I was paddling and swapping with them. So I was one, three, five, as much as I could, two, four, six, as much as I could. And then I would steer from there. If I had my hand down here as my steering option, and then I had to go up here, I would have probably missed one or two strokes. So, <clears throat> How you escalate your steering stroke from this to this to this really depends on how long you are taking to affect change on the canoe. So if you're here and you're hanging out and it's one, two, three, four, five strokes and your canoe is still not responding the way you want it to, then chances are you need a more aggressive stroke. So by a little turn, you can now reduce that number of strokes that you're missing as a paddler from five or six to maybe two. And then this, once again, that's a pretty aggressive steering stroke. We do that when we do uh, sprint, sprint turns or 
if your boat loses control or if uh, somebody is hitting you from the side or from behind, then you're going to have a more aggressive stroke. Okay, so a couple of uh, stories that I want to tell you before we kind of go on is that, okay, that goon stroke that I was talking about, the, the standing draw, that's got a lot of drag on it. So you've got to be very, very particular about when you would use that stroke. Now, there are some times, um, I mostly will use that if I'm out of control, if a canoe has hit me or if the arm is coming up and, I, and I'm too nervous to go on the right-hand side, then I'll do that big, strong, strong, strong stroke. But really, uh, for my strength, um, I can't really affect that much change with it. So here's a couple of war stories that I'm going to tell you about. So um, very, very good friend of mine, very strong man, uh, typically is not a steers person, will sit in the middle of the boat, was training for a big race. This is many years ago, prime of his life. And um, he was the backup steersman for Catalina. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have paddled Catalina before, but the men's race goes from Catalina Island back to Long Beach. And in that particular race, the wind generally hits from the Ama side. So when a boat, when, when you have wind effect on your boat, the boat will generally track into the wind. So it'll track to the left. Now this person had been steering, feeling very confident at home in uh, Canadian water and was paddle steering. So was done using those strokes like this and never really affecting any change for steering with a, with a poke stroke. Got to Catalina, got in to take a stint and got his butt kicked because he had no basic stroke technique and no confidence specifically on the right-hand side when it came to steering the boat. So as you're heading down, boat's heading into the wind, you've got to affect a very strong steering stroke on the right-hand side. So he was trying to affect all of this by doing paddling strokes and um, he learned his lesson and he got out and he says that even a strong, big, strong guy like that was not able to manage the canoe. So. In flat water, we can get pretty complacent and we can rely on those lazy strokes, that nice little poke. We don't really need to ever affect these big changes and uh, it'll, come to, it'll come back to haunt you for sure. Uh, <clears throat> as far as hand positions, this is where I think the better you get, the more relaxed you can become with uh, your hand positions. So at the beginning, when you're a beginner, moving into intermediate, when you're learning your strokes, I like to have it up here. Your fulcrum is here, your load is here, your force is here, way easier on you. Super easy for you to manage that. You start moving your hand down here, you're gonna have more difficulty affecting that stroke. However, when you are now given her and you're becoming a paddler with your team, and you're pushing that steer stroke in, it may be that that's what you get. And I'm gonna be okay with that. Even though I'm gonna tell you, if you ever come to my clinic, I'm gonna make you put your hand on the top. And a lot of the drills that I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna make you put your hand on the top. But as you get better and more, you get more relaxed with your steering and you get better at being able to stick that paddle to the side of the boat, you're gonna be able to move your hands around a little bit more because ultimately, you're not gonna be in there for very long before you're paddling again. In particular, on my right-hand side, when I'm in big water, I take my hand, my right hand, and I usually steer with it about halfway and I'll jam it in and I'll have my other hand to the left. It's not down here because I just, I'm not strong enough to be able to hold it there. But I am here because if I need to pull, I've got a little bit more leverage. On this side, I tend to hold here, hold here, hold here, whatever it is. When I'm sprint paddling, I'm always on the top, always on the top because I'm generally paddling most and then jamming a steer stroke in. So the key is, and I call it, what I call it is feeling like I've got Velcro on my paddle. 
is that I want to, I want all of you to get to the point where you can jam the stroke wherever you are, in here, in there, back here, whatever it is, you're paddling on, on this side, you flip over, your changes are rock solid, but you want to make it feel that your, your paddle has Velcro on it and it's just going to stick to the side. And that just comes with lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. <clears throat> Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get Leanne to tee up the video. I've got a little video for you guys to watch, and it's Team Primo out of Hawaii. And before we start, I just want to set it up. It's going to be a super distracting video because it is, they're, they're, it's, it's a sleigh ride. These guys are on a sleigh ride. But I want you to stare stare at the steersman whatever you do just stop don't stop staring at the steersman and i want you to observe what he's doing and then we'll talk a little bit about it at the end is it up there for everybody yep all right there's no sound for a reason okay don't take don't take your eyes off that steersman Okay, they're bailing here, so he's a little bit more relaxed. Okay, this is a set. This is a second steersman. He still he steers quite different. Okay, I think that's good. <clears throat> okay, so some of the observations, I mean, pretty cool, wasn't it? I mean, could you imagine if that was in our backyard, if we had that all the time? It's stuff that you dream of. But um, one of the things that I want to highlight is that never once did that guy have to figure out where his paddle needed to go. He didn't have to think about it. It was second nature. It was Velcro on the side of the canoe, and there it was. And he didn't ever once have to think, well, am I poking straight? Am I turning my hand? Am I going aggressive? He never had to think about that once. He never had to think about what his hand placement was gonna be. The first guy, I don't even know if you noticed, but he went from left to right and he was like a ninja. I never even saw him move that paddle over and all of a sudden he's paddling on or he's steering on the right hand side. I mean, it is remarkable to see when you have somebody who's just so good at their job um it's 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 just ingrained in their whole soul it just it's just happening they're responding they're responding instantly and they're responding so beautifully and gracefully and he's and he and he's making it all happen so what i loved about that video is that um they were going they were going hard and 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 it was super exciting but never once did that steersman, either one of them, lose control of the boat? And is, they could have. It, it, there was lots of opportunity for them to lose control of that boat, but they never did because they had a dial. And so I guess what I'm saying to you, the difference between an, a beginner to an intermediate steersman is really making sure that in all circumstances, you have that Velcro on the side of the boat, that it's instinctual, that it's there's no thought to it it's just happening and your body it, your body is vibrating steering and that doesn't come without a whole lot of steering the other thing that you should notice maybe in that video is that he was um he was a steersman first and a paddler second 
Okay, so this is another critical thing that happens as you move up the steering pendulum of skill is that you need to remember you are a steersman first and a paddler second. And what we get, what happens with us in flat water is that we get complacent about that. We do believe that we can take that one more stroke, one more paddle stroke, and then the canoe starts to move. And I have an expression and it's called, it says pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. And it's really about if you take that one extra stroke, then chances are your canoe is going to go off. And now you've got to jam in a way more aggressive steer stroke, which slows the boat. Remember, every time you steer, you're slowing the canoe down. So if you're jamming in a more aggressive stroke, you're slowing the canoe down even more. So <clears throat> um, I've got some drills. I got a whole bunch of drills at the end that I'm going to um, give to you. But uh, really, I guess the highlight of all of this is that steering strokes are pretty basic, but you need to have them on the back of your hand. You need to be able to dial into them at any time. You need to have Velcro on the side of your canoe that is going to just let, I mean, I have a love affair with my pat, with my steering blade. And, and I think that any longtime paddlers have that love affair with their steering blade because I mean, I've been to war with that thing and it's just not, never let me down. And um, people have tried to talk me into different steering blades and I've tried them, but ultimately, I don't know if I could ever be separated from that. So I think that you have to develop this really um, intuitive sense of uh, trust with your paddle and, and trust with the side of the canoe and, and just, just get her done. Um, the next phase is really about the precision, right? So um, as you get really, really good at your strokes and they become, they start to become easy you can start to make it hard again for, with yourself. And that comes in the form of precision, but that's sort of more advanced steering stuff and we can deal with that at a later time. So um, I thought what we could do now just to break it up is open it up for some questions, maybe one or two or three, and then we can kind of move on to the next phase. I have one that first uh, steersman in, in the video yeah, did something that we actually do in marathon canoeing as well. But there it's really called a goon stroke. So you let your blade slip further backwards, which gives you better angle. And then you kind of push it outwards, which gives you maximum leverage. Do you do that? And uh, so that, that guy obviously does did that uh, because he was riding on a wave and he did needed maximum leverage to keep uh, the, uh, the bow straight. Um, is that something you, you, uh, you teach? So instead of holding it in front of you and having the blade basically at your knee, let it slip basically to his hip or even further back and then leverage it outwards. Yeah, so a lot of that, I mean, I can, I recognize that that's Christian's, Christian's voice. So um, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of that uh, comes to do with basically where your paddle lands. I mean, I had a, I paddled with a girl uh, one year at Molokai. She was maybe a hundred pounds and um, she was very, very thorough on her hand placement with her paddle. She was definitely a steersman first. And what she would do is she would run, she would have her hand, her paddle in her hand like this and she would run her forearm down the gunnel and then she controlled everything from there. Okay, so she never let it slip back there because it was never gonna work for her. But I'm more of a paddling kind of steersman. So when I'm out riding, riding waves like that, I'm like that guy. I'm just like giving her, giving her, giving her steering. And then what happens in that situation is it does slip. And then you're in this, you have no real other option, you guys, but to start to do a more aggressive stroke. And it doesn't really matter, I guess, because you're, in, in most cases, those guys kind of needed that aggressive stroke. I mean, did you see, uh, did you happen to see on this side how deep they were going? You know, some, sometimes they were up into their elbow and that was as a result of it flipping back. So yes, Christian, that is a, that's in the arsenal, let's say. And, and I think that that's really important to note when we're talking about intermediate steering moving towards advanced is that your arsenal is going to be very personal. And I can say 
textbook, this is how it should go. And textbook, this is how you hold your hands. And it's physics, baby. You know, uh, it's all about leverage and fulcrum and load and power and, and drag and drag coefficients and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, the art part comes in you having your own style um, in any given situation. Okay, uh, we've got Cynthia with her hand up. Cynthia, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, ask your question. Um, and it comes back to a little bit, like one of the things you talked about was leverage and efficiency and strength, because um, sometimes you'll see canoes start to slide and the steersman will do everything they can do to try to stop that canoe from sliding with steering strokes. And they'll be in, you know, the sixth, seventh, eighth steering stroke when one good poke would have done it. And then they can get the canoe back online. Yeah, okay, so, so you're talking about paddling strokes, not steering Yeah, strokes, they try to, they, they're trying to draw the canoe around with a draw stroke and they'll try that for five, six, seven strokes yeah. when a simple poke would have done the job. Yeah. So I, I want, as much as the poke is, I mean, the drag of a poke is what steers the canoe, but it's, it's you know, the, the poke is, is the golden, to me is, is, is golden over seven or eight draw strokes. Yeah, I mean, okay, so let's go back to the video we just watched. How often did you see that guy doing any paddling strokes? Zero. I think the second guy took a couple and he did, he actually, the second guy did a stroke that I'm gonna show you a little bit later that's actually more effective for the unlimited canoes, but you never saw them doing any paddling strokes. They were poking. They were in, poke, do their job, back paddling. In, poke, do their job, back paddling. Those paddling strokes, they are something that we do here on flat water and it makes us lazy and it is quite often not effective as you start to increase the, the uh, intensity of the water that you are in. Um, however, I am gonna talk about it a little bit later with unlimiteds and there is a time and a place for paddling strokes as steering strokes. But I, I don't think you can ignore it, honestly. I mean, there are times when you just have to it just makes sense. And I mean, I see, what your I see what your point is saying, Cindy, is that be careful, be careful. As soon as you are paddling, paddling, because it takes a toll on you. For me, I won't do it. I very rarely do paddling steer strokes. It's too hard on me. One, two, three, and you know, my crew is going, what are you doing back there? I mean, the other thing that's, that paddling strokes, paddling steering strokes do is it twists the canoe. And if you've ever sat in five seat, when you've got a big, strong guy trying to haul that pad, that stroke around, that canoe around, it twists the canoe. And I, I can't imagine that that's not slowing the boat down as well. So really good point, Cindy, thanks. Yeah, I, I think as you mentioned earlier, uh, Cheryl, I think once you become familiar with what your repertoire is, you also become familiar with the conditions under which you can ex pro, you know, effectively execute you know, which kinds of strokes, like you were saying, you know, on a flat day, you might be able to do the paddle strokes, but as soon as the wind picks up, or as soon as you've got some kind of a current, you know, you're probably going to have to abandon that and just go back to the basics, like you were mentioning, I think. Yeah. Right? Does and that make sense? Basics are gold, you guys, they will haunt you. You will be haunted. I guarantee you, if you don't have them down. Yeah. And, um, uh, it's, I'd like to say, the, 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 the test that I always give myself is that if I have to be out, okay, once again, we're talking about um, doing the best I can to put forward momentum into the canoe. So if I have to steer for longer than two paddle strokes, so if my poke is in there for longer than two paddle strokes, then I need to go up to the next more aggressive steering stroke. So that means, like as Cindy was saying, if you're sitting there and you're trying to affect change with this paddle stroke, paddle steering stroke, and it's not happening, it's time to get in there and poke. And if you're sitting there like a human rudder and it's one, two, three, four, and it's still not changing, then guess what? Make it a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more aggressive. <coughs> we've got some, we've also got some questions in the chat. Um, Daphne was asking about the suggested length of steering blade 
And I think mm. everyone else is also wondering um, which model of steering blade is, is the one that you're in love with behind you. I have a love affair with. <laughs> uh, I don't even know. I, I gotta tell you a quick funny story about this just because it's just, it's it has to do with the love affair of my paddle. This is a Kealoa. And uh, I was sponsored for Kiela, by Kealoa for a long time. When I was in Australia, I was sponsored by Kealoa. And on the Canadian team, we were sponsored by Kealoa. I, there's a lot of beautiful steering stroke, uh, steering paddles out there, you guys. So this just happens to be mine, okay? It just happens to be mine. But we were uh, training for world sprints. And in the process of training for world sprints, we were always in canoes that didn't have covers. And the uh, we, we came back from, from world sprints and we went to Gibson's. And Gibson's race, we had covers on the canoe. And I had this paddle and I'm steering along and whew, 15 minutes into the race, I did a changeover. My paddle hit the cover because I wasn't used to having hoops in front of me, flew out of my hand, gone. And we're like full on racing. So, and we're winning. And I, you know, and even though I love this paddle, I was going to let it go. So I had to let it go. Now, fortunately I had a, a spare on, on the Ayaku. So we got the spare, we sorted it out, finished the race, made an embarrassing announcement to everyone in the, at the awards that I had lost my paddle and um, got heckled for that for a very long time. And then as it turned out, somebody found it. It floated to shore and someone found it and put it in, uh, in the, the buy or the lost and found in the paper in Gibson's and one of the local Local paddlers grabbed it for me and I got it back. So this is it. See, that's why we're never going to separate. <laughs> okay, so as far as length is concerned, you guys, I paddle with the exact same length paddle as I paddle with a regular paddle. So I paddle with a 50. This is a 50. Mm -hmm. That's what I paddle with on a regular paddle. And that's how long my steering blade is. I've also heard that the steers blade uh, should be uh, an inch longer than your regular paddle. Do you have comments my shoulders. That? Yeah, okay. You know, like the longer it is, you guys remember, you're always bringing it up and over, right? Yeah. And, and the steering blade has a longer, has a longer blade than a regular blade. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> you start getting longer and you're, you're having to lift every single time you switch. And we as, as steersmen, we switch all the time. I mean, <laughs> you watch that video. Those guys were ridiculous. I mean, that first guy, I, I sat and I stared at that video probably 15 times. And there are times when I couldn't even see him switch over to the right side. He, he was all of a sudden steering on the right side. I go, what? A, how did that happen? And okay, let's get one more other... question and then oh. we'll move on. Okay, we've got, actually, we've got a couple other questions uh, about, uh, about the poke. Uh, Gus is asking, how deep would you poke? And then Matt mm -hmm. is asking, on the third version, uh, the most aggressive one, uh, you had it had the bottom of the blade angled out um is that is that typical or could the blade be more parallel to the canoe is, he's asking no so what it's it's a progression right you guys so okay what was the first one wrong sorry uh how how deep would you poke at like the full full width full depth full depth you're always you're always uh your your blade is always buried it's like a paddling stroke you're, there's no sense you're steering like this with this much water. You have gotta use your blade. And the, I mean, that is the downside about this paddling blade is that it's big, right? So um, I, I can affect change really quickly with this because look at how much surface area there is, right? So I'm fully buried. So, and then, so the then instead- you said was this paddle stroke. Yeah, like that's the progression. So one, two, that's going to be a little bit more drag. If you need a more aggressive stroke than that, then you, then you just pull back. You use the canoe as the fulcrum. Your hand is the, is the effort and your load is the water. So you just pull back. And I, I can't the, imagine why you'd be pulling back like this. It, it just yeah. doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense that that would be my natural progression after this. I think what the, I think the question I think it would be more um, obvious when the person is actually steering in the water conditions because, like you just mentioned, 
um, the water will provide the resistance for that for when you're leaning back. So you're not going to do something like that in in you know flat conditions. It's going to be when it, the wind is gusting at you know 20 kilometers an hour or whatever, and you're you know and you're really fighting something. Is that would that would you say that's I mean, here's an example of a situation where we were at World Sprints and we were, uh, this was in Sacramento and we were coming into a turn and I didn't nail this turn. We were, uh, the wind got affected or something. So we were going to hit the buoy. And, hmm. Okay, this is one of those smug moments, you guys, where nobody in the world would have even known what I had just did. And I, even I amazed myself in that moment. But you can't even say it to anyone. But what I did was somehow I knew this was happening. I could See my alma, the back part of my alma was about to run over the buoy. I just took the paddle and I jammed it underneath the boat and I pulled it like this. And what it did is it essentially pushed the canoe, the whole canoe back into the canoe. It pushed it over three feet and we missed hitting that, running over that uh, turn boy. So like, it, it's just one of those things where if you have a handle on all of those variations. I mean, this is not textbook stuff. This is the artistic part of steering. And this was gets us so amped really is that there's all of these options and you can make whatever you want yours as long as you're not slowing your canoe down too much. As long as you're still making that canoe go as fast as you can forward. Uh, there was one other question in the chat. We may as well get to it. Um, currents, currents and steering strokes. Uh, when do you fight it or surrender to it? I suppose the uh, to the currents. I suppose. I, okay. Uh, okay. Let's talk about I that a little that, bit later. Let's let's talk about that a little okay. bit later. Because that comes. Okay. I kind of deal with it a little bit later, in a way. But we can clarify it later. Okay. So is it okay if we move on? I think so. Eric has his hand up, but I'm not sure why. Okay. Uh, yeah, Cheryl, I just wanted uh, to comment on West Coast waters, which are sort of neutral to medium much of the time. I just yeah. wanted to sort of caution or have you comment on the uh, the right side pry that one of your one of the steersman's jobs as well, not just sort of uh, uh, do no do no harm by creating excess drag but also keeping the boat upright. So maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so maybe maybe just comment on that for sort of novice to intermediate level steers okay. people who may not know that those prize have consequences on yeah. the right. Yeah, okay, so that, thanks Eric for that. Okay, what he's talking about is that um, your arm is over here, right? You are at the back of the boat. <clears throat> so what, what you do at the back of the boat is gonna affect change as far as how your boat is navigating forward. But it's also going to affect change on the balance of your canoe, right? So if you've got a, if you've got a right hand steer stroke that you're doing, you're here, you're here, you're here. As soon as you start to go here, the deeper you are, what what are you doing? Is you are going to essentially affect what's happening on the alma side, right? So if you're here and you're here. Um, that should be pretty safe, but as soon as you start to come low, so now you've got, like for me, I've got my one hand, that's how I like to steer on my right hand side if it's pretty rough. I got my left hand out here and I'm, I'm here. As soon as I start to push that under the canoe, I can roll the canoe really easily. So, um, is that what you mean, Eric? Sorry, yeah, I just, I just wanted people to be mindful that, uh, that you've been describing that you need to sort of uh, make the boat go as fast as you can in the line that you want it to uh, by being uh, efficient in your pokes or whatever the interventions are, but that those last resort prize, those bigger prize, the more aggressive drag inducing prize, do have consequences on the, on the stability of the canoe. That's all I wanted you to mention, which oh, is great. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, and all right, so back to the video a little bit. Those guys were doing aggressive steer strokes. I mean, there was rooster tails coming off the back of their, their paddles, right? So 
they they had that nailed. They had that balance point nailed, and and they also had crews that were going to help them. So that's a little bit more advanced, but absolutely, Eric. Uh, just be careful. You only you only have to flip once, you guys, to know that whatever you're doing on this side, that arm is going to come up. You won't ever do it again. All right. Well, you'll try not to do it again anyway. Okay. So, all right. So we're going to move on to canoe setup. So. Uh, Really, this is that beginning part was all about have those strokes nailed. They're your gold. That's your, like, seriously, it's your currency that you offer your canoe. And uh, the better you are at it, the better you're going to be as a steersman. And remember, secondly, that you are a steersman first, paddler second. So, what else has a center? What other centers of influence will affect your ability to steer well? Um, canoe setup. Okay, so first off, you've got rigging. How a canoe is rigged is really going to affect how you are running as a steersman. I mean, I'm not going to get into this really because you guys, this is a club based thing that everybody in the club should know how to rig or at least know the, the, what, why you're rigging a certain way. I mean, in my lifetime as a steersman, I always rigged my own canoe. And it was very unusual as a woman to rock up to a race and um and see a women's team rigging their own canoe but it's just something that i did my whole life i mean i'm the captain i'm responsible for the safety of my crew and i want to know that my canoe is rigging is running well for us so uh it's just something that i took to heart so every club should run a rigging clinic um, i know with unlimited it's a little bit different but you should know why it's rigged the way it is and what are the options for your club um, based on a heavy crew, a light crew. So that's all uh, a little bit more advanced. So we were not gonna deal with it too much. Just know that a rig, a badly rigged canoe will make it very hard for you as a steersman. Um, second, canoe setup. So this is your power distribution, your weight distribution of your crew through the line of the, canoe, the club, of the canoe. So uh, you got one, three, five paddling on one side, two, four, six paddling on the other side. Um, <laughs> if you don't get this right, you guys, it could be the difference between a dreamy steering experience and a supper fest. And as much as it sounds like it's science, it's kind of not sometimes. Like you will be amazed how unusual a setup will be. So um personally this is how i like to go strongest guy in four because remember when you are steering you are no longer paddling so that means the only people who are steering on your side are two and four you're out of the game so that means your two and four have to be pretty darn strong to offset a one three five steering or paddling option on that side okay so i always like to put my strong guy in two and four my next important position is five seat. Five seat for me as a steersman is critical because what five does is, is transferred exactly onto the AMA. So if they're all rough, the AMA is all rough. If they're all rough and at a time, you're struggling behind them. My, my, I, I absolutely insist when I'm paddling in a crew that I've got a strong, even if they don't know how to steer, even if they're not going to help me at all, I want someone who's smooth, technical, and strong in five seat. Because when I have to stop to steer, I'm no longer paddling, I'm stopping to steer. That means there's no momentum in the back of the canoe. I, it's stalled. So I have to have five seat take that momentum on behalf of the whole crew. So if the stronger that I have a five seat as a paddler, the easier it is for me to steer. The smoother that guy is, or that gal is, the easier it is for me to steer because they're not affecting the AMA. So <clears throat> if I have any problems at all with timing or strength or experience, I usually put that person in three seat. And the reason is, is because they're timing directly from one seat. So if they're struggling with timing, they're, they're not having to figure it out it's not getting worse as it's moving down the canoe. They're, they're timing exactly from one seat. They've got a whole group of people behind them to help them. And um, 
three seat, there's no, there's no place that you can hide anyone in a canoe, but three seat, if you're gonna hide somebody, that's gonna be the best place. And it's very different thinking because everyone likes to put the person that's having the problem with timing in five seat. But as a steersman, it's, it's a terrible, it's terrible. But having said that, when you're in training, this is the time to make mistakes. So load your canoe up, be open-minded, coaches, coaches, if there's coaches out there, teach versatility. Everybody should be able to paddle in every seat. I mean, we, the Molokai crew that we won with in 2004, it was a long time ago, I know. There's 10 of us in uh, Molokai crew and eight of us could steer. We didn't all steer that race, but we all had the ability to steer really well. Our two best strokes were our two best steersmen. All of us could sit in every seat. It didn't matter. If the coach came to us and said, you're going into three, you're going into five, you're going into two, we all knew what to do. And there was no demotion. It wasn't like, uh, it makes me crazy when people, for some reason, there's some sort of mystique around one seat that if you are moved out of one seat into another seat, it's a demotion. It's absolutely not. So I think that in the process of crew setup, coaches, crews, there's no demotion. The best seat is the seat you're in. So make it the best seat and do your job. And I mean, I can't, I mean, I can't, I can't stress it anymore because uh, um, the more versatile you are, the better paddler you are, the more valuable you are to your crew, the more valuable you are to your program. Uh, okay, um, leadership, next one. So if, as if you didn't have enough to do already, you've got to steer, you've got to uh, set your crew up well, you've got to understand the conditions. Um, now you have to lead your crew. And this is where you have to kind of enter the Goldilocks zone, which is not too much, not too little, just perfect. Um, so over the years, I would say that, I don't know, I kind of feel like maybe that's one of my strengths that I've always bought to my, brought to my crew because I just really dig them. And I just really dig the fact that they're allowing me to steer this boat for them and that I get to um, be part of this very cool situation with, there's only a few of us in the boat and it's kind of my job to have a little bit of extra ability to look around, to communicate, to tell them, to talk to them, to rise them up. So um, I think that for me, I've always taken the leadership part on as a very serious um, difference maker. I mean, honestly, you guys, anyone can learn how to steer. You can master those strokes. Yes, there's an art to it. Once you start getting into diverse water, that happens. But for the most part, most of our races we're doing are sit fairly flat, not too consequential. And so what is the difference maker? Fitness, maybe. I call it heart. And if you have good leadership in your canoe and you pro provide that heart in the canoe and you race with heart, that will make a difference. People who race with heart, is, they're scary. They're, they're a scary, scary crew because anything can happen. They can come out of anywhere. They can come from nowhere and come forward. So I think the leadership aspect of that is really where you can make a difference. So I'm just gonna pop through a few lists, uh, a few things on my list here. Develop your own style and your own comfort. How do you like to communicate? How often do you like to communicate? You know, this is a stereotype, but guys typically don't like as much talk in the, in the boat as girls. But then I, one year I paddled with a marathon crew out of Wisconsin at Molokai and no one could talk. In Hawaii, no one's allowed to talk in the canoe except the steersman. So there's culturally, there's all sorts of rules around this, but as a steersman, just de develop your own style and your own comfort. Speaking of manner and tone, that tone thing is kind of critical because when you're in the heat of the moment, your tone can change a lot. And it can go from 
happy and bubbly to mean and angry. And I would say that of all the influences of me in, in, in paddling over the years, the thing that affects me the most is the steersman's tone. And if I've been in boats with very good steersmen with terrible tones who just made me feel not very good when they opened their mouth. And I found it very hard to be inspired by their, um, by their communication. So be careful about that. Understand what's happening. Um, commanding versus bossy. I mean, I guess that's kind of how you can go. Do you want bossy? Or do you want commanding? Um, be precise and concise with your communication. Okay, so here, this is my pet peeve. You're paddling along and you hear timing, timing, and you're like, Phew! instantly, what happens to your crew? What do, you, what do you mean? Like, is it me? Is it them? Like, you have given your crew nothing except confusion and, and, um, and the ability to now take them away from their game. So what I like to do is two seat your head, two seat your head, two seat your head, two seat, that's it. You got it. So not only are you giving feedback, but you're giving them the opportunity to see when they're doing it right. So they know they're feeling it right. They're like, okay, I got it. I got it. Give that feedback. So precise and concise. Keep your language positive. Another pet peeve of mine. You can spin anything to the positive, you guys, and practice this. Okay, so how's this? They're catching us. Holy crap. What do you think your crew is saying? Holy crap, they're catching us? What do you mean? Like, you can see, everyone just tightens up, and they're like, mm. you know, no one's paddling well, because now all of a sudden, all they're thinking about is they're catching us, right? They have, you have vaulted your entire crew from your boat into their boat. And that is not where you want your crew to be. You're, you want your crew to be in your own boat. Okay, so what's a better thing to say? That's it, you guys, we got it. We gotta make it happen. We've, you know, like what I do with my crew is I tell them how many boat lengths we're ahead because they all wanna know. We're two boat lengths ahead, we're five boat lengths ahead. Okay, so this is always the distance, right? So if they know there are five distance, about five boat lengths ahead, and then they've gone to three boat lengths ahead. That keeps us in our own boat and just say, they're making their move. They're making a move, you guys. We got to match it. Let's match it. Okay, so essentially what you've done is you've kept your crew in your own boat. Practice this. It's, it's a kind of a big deal. Everything can be spun from negative to positive. Uh, okay, be prepared to suffer. As a steersman, you are going to suffer. Your body is on the line for your crew. I have done whole races where I've only paddled on the left. The entire, the entire race, because that is how we're running best, how it's most comfortable, how we're not vulnerable, how we're not gonna flip, how you know the wind direction is going, whatever you have to do, you are a full and you're in full sacrifice for your crew. Now, <clears throat> don't be stupid. You can use people in your boat. You can help, they can help you. So if you're paddling on the left, left, left the whole time, you can say to five seat, hey, I want you to stay on the left for a bit. It gives you a break to come over to the right-hand side. So, you know, you don't have to completely sacrifice yourself, but there are times when it's just going to happen. I mean, I did a race one year with Molokai and I, they, had to, they had to lift me out of the canoe at the end. I was a mess. Um... Empower your crew. You're on the same team. They're not the enemy. The enemy is all around you, but your crew is your team. I use people's names a lot. And I find that that really helps. People like to be called by their name. Leanne, we always called Leanne Stanley because Stanley, we had another Leanne in the crew. So Stanley was always her name. And I just love Stanley. I love saying Stanley's name because I knew that as soon as I said Stanley, you're there, you know, you knew that right away, you could just see it just change. So empower your crew. <clears throat> um, and do whatever you need to do to build trust. Um, okay, this is the picture I'm going to show you from Hamilton Island. It's kind of badass. It's a photo that got used a lot. Um, you'll notice a few people in there, a Scatter Chicks crew, like a Canadian crew that went to 
Hamilton Island in Australia one year. Um, we did the around the island race. We held the record for a long time. Um, this, this was captured and uh, it was, um, yeah, uh, Leanne's gonna put it, uh, next one. That one, yeah. Is it this one? Nope, it's the one with the, uh, the money that picture. One? Nope, the other one. That one? Yeah, that one. Oh, that one. <laughs> okay, so you can see, see my hand placement, it isn't ideal. But um, like, look at us, look at us. We are so dialed and so in the zone and everyone is trusting everyone else. And that picture, you guys, kind of became a famous picture in Australia for that reason. I mean, there's water coming off and all that sort of stuff, but look at everyone's face. Lori, Val Lori Valesic, you know Lori, everyone knows Lori. Look at her in one seat. Like, she's scary. She's scary. Like, a Tracy Lambo's in number two. She is scary. In the back, no one's, no one in that boat is questioning whether or not I'm doing my job. And nobody, I'm not questioning if anyone else is doing our job. That is a picture of absolute trust. And I think that for magic to happen in a crew, you have to find that place where there's absolute trust. And as a steersman, you do have the ability to make that difference. <clears throat> okay, how are we doing for time? Alrighty, so what I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, spec versus unlimited. And because um, uh, um, a lot of clubs are moving almost exclusively to unlimited canoes. And I mean, it's kind of a deal changer for steersmen for sure. And for, uh, for crews in general. So um, what I'll say about this, I'm just gonna kind of cruise through a list of it and we'll talk briefly about each one. Um, unlimited canoes are way less forgiving. Everything happens fast. Everything is lighter. Um, your steer strokes are going to be uh, pretty effective right away. Uh, it's way easier to oversteer. So you can get into that place where you're oversteering, oversteering, oversteering. If you do get into that place where you start to oversteer, just stop everybody. Just make yourself stop. It happens to me even now where I'll get into a boat and I'll be like, oh man, like I totally blew that one. Now I have, here I am on, on the other side. Just take a moment stop, hold your paddle in your hand, and then start over. The, the Unlimited is kind of that sort of canoe in that it does ask you to react quickly and it, um, it has a natural ability for you to overreact to that. Um, I, I, I would say that the proper loading of the canoe, your crew setup is pretty vital in a unlimited versus a spec boat. Um, the spec boat can be kind of forgiving, um, but uh, unlimited boat is not that forgiving. I found anyway, and I was steering with the men's crew here and in particular the men, cause I'm like, even though I'm a big gal, I'm, I'm kind of small relative to a guy. So um, I had a little bit of a, more of a challenge with that. <clears throat> Steering blade selection is, I find, pretty critical. Um, you have to feel very comfortable, excuse me. You have to feel pretty comfortable with your steering blade. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I find, and Eric and I talked about this the other day a little bit. Um, with the Unlimited, you really, I find, we, I really have to steer really high, very, very far forward. As soon as I start to let it slip back here, it just slips off and I just have no purchase. So I tend to like to slide my steering blade way up front, more, more so than I have ever done in the past with the spec boat. I, I, kind of like, I steer up front. <clears throat> That's me. You guys are going to find your own special sweet spot, but I find in particular it likes it up front. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is where... What I found with a unlimited is it likes to slide. It slides around. That is what the boat is supposed to do, you guys. So try not to um, control that. 
try to find some comfort in letting the boat slide around. And it's kind of the magic of the boat, I find. I, I kind of find that that part's a little bit special. And as soon as you started manhandling that boat and controlling it, I call it um, controlling versus managing. So I don't want to be a micromanager of my canoe. I just want to encourage it, right? So as it's sliding around, I want it to find its sweet spot and I want it to kind of tell me, all right, this is where I want to be. So then I got to say, okay, well, is that suit where we're going? So let it slide and uh, the magic will happen. I think that's really what these boats are so incredible at. Uh, big water. The bigger the water that gets, more critical five seat is. And um, anything you watch on YouTube, you're going to see you guys in the big water. It's a two person job back there. They've got both guys, gals holding on to that boat from five and six seat. So as we start to move into bigger races, as you start to move into bigger races with your crews in unlimited boats with bigger water, it's pretty vital that you've got a five, six seat combination of steering. And I think that's what makes it kind of exciting is that um, there is so many more options with having two people steer that canoe from the back. <clears throat> All right, this is my special stroke that I love in an unlimited. It's a floater stroke. And you saw the second guy did it in that video I showed you. He did it on the left. And uh, what it is, is you take your paddle, I'm gonna do it on the right hand side just cause that's the side that's easiest. And you pull, you put your paddle about a foot away from the side of your canoe. It's not a standing drop, but what you do is you just let it float back and forth. And it's kind of like this. And what it does is that it moves the canoe toward, it's a little feather stroke that moves the canoe towards the paddle. And as that canoe likes to slide, you're gonna be able to use this really nice. It's not an easy stroke and it's very physical. So it's gonna take you some time to get that purchase. But if you have the ability in the unlimited to start to use this stroke, it's pretty magic actually. <clears throat> and it really works well with, with allowing that canoe to slide. Um, okay, that's it. I've got some drills and then I've got a little bit about race prep. So I don't know how we want to handle it, Ron and Eric, if we want to, um, um, how do you want to do it? Carol, I'm going to suggest that you just push on. And uh, I think people are hungry and eager to get these drills. And just as a, an assurance to the audience, uh, we will transcribe these drills and uh, they'll accompany the uh, stuff on the website as well. So it'll all be there in sort of a crazy format. But uh, Cheryl, if it's okay with you, I just have you uh, push on. Okay, that sounds good. All right, I'm going to do, I'm going to briefly go over these drills. What the point of these drills are to do, you guys, for as steersmen is to make you uncomfortable. Uh, is to force you to start to move your steer stroke up from this to this to this. It allows you to understand the difference in your own personal strength and abilities when you're paddle steering versus poking. And um, you know, it'll get your crew uh, engaged in what you're doing in order to help you get uh, in order for them to give you feedback that's meaningful. Okay, so um, uh, <clears throat> okay, so the biggest thing for me is to when you're in practice, it's really hard to do because you don't want to do it. You usually end up going into the wind or coming with the wind, but it, it's vital in practice times to do your triangle courses, to go side onto the wind, to go quarter onto the wind, to go. Um, I, you know, it's just, uh, make it uncomfortable, make it uncomfortable for you to steer where you actually have to work, where you have to become the steersman first and the paddler second. Um, this was vital for me there. I did this big race in Australia and we had this quarter side left wind that was just popping her arm, popping her arm, popping her arm. And 
the canoe just kept wanting to go into that direction. And I'll tell you, it was awful. It was probably the worst race I've ever had to steer ever. And the way I managed it was I took my steering blade and I jammed it up. I steered this way. So I would paddle, paddle, paddle as much as I can to try, try and keep the momentum through the canoe. And then when I had to steer, half throat and I jammed it up front. And those kind of things you're not going to learn. You don't want to have to learn those in a race. You want to learn those in, in, in your paddling practice. <clears throat> uh, um, okay, this is another magic one, especially if you're doing sprints. Uh, change every time with your with your crew. So if you are, you're going to change. You're going to be on the same side as two, four, six every time. So change, change, and then steer. So I'm paddling, paddling, paddling. I've got to come over and I've got to steer. Then I go back, paddle, paddle, paddle. Come over and steer. Paddle, paddle, paddle. It'll it'll help you get your changeovers really nailed. It'll help you get your velcro on the side of the canoe. And it'll help you um, um, be more precise with your steering because you have to get it in there and get it out. Um, okay, so the next thing I, I, I mean, so what I do, you guys, I, I'm gonna go through this and there's gonna be lots of them that, there's, there's 12 of them. I mean, there's lots of different drills. So, Probably the best thing for, the, for me to do with most of them is just packaging them up and send them to you. But I always challenge myself when I'm out steering. I'm not ever complacent. And because most of my paddling career, you guys, in Canada, there was nobody who challenged me as a steersman. I had no coach. Nobody even knew how to, I, most of the pictures and the races I wasn't even in because people didn't even want to take pictures of the sixth person, right? Because it was just, we were just out of the loop, right? Everyone wanted to look at the paddles, but no one wanted to look at the steers. So I had to challenge myself. And I also had to, as Leanne will attest to, while we were training for New Caledonia, I had to challenge my crew, crew to challenge myself. So every time we were doing something, I would just let them know what I was working on. So this is one of my favorite, and that is, is that my steer stroke can't last more than two strokes. So if my steer stroke is lasting more than two paddle strokes from my club, my crew, then I'm losing and I am doing a disservice for my crew. So I had to go up, you know, from straight to turn to this. I had to learn that. And I learned pretty quickly that my paddling steer strokes sucked and that they took way longer than two two paddling strokes for the rest of my crew. Um, uh, in the unlimited, this is a good one, is that do same side drill. So everybody's on the same side, including the steersman and you're zooming around circles, zooming around circles. It will help you with your balance, the whole crew, and it'll help you with your steering. Cause steersman, you gotta be in time when you're paddling. How many times have you seen steersmen that are out of time? Almost all the time, you guys. Those pictures, maybe that's why we're never included in the pictures because it always looks like the steersman's out of time. You have to be in time. If you're gonna paddle, you have to be in time. So this will help you with your timing on that. And once you start, okay, so go left first. So you've got the alma on the inside, but then go right too. And graduate yourself up into bigger and bigger and bigger water and it'll be a really eye-opening experience for you and your crew because it'll help you learn your balance points um <clears throat> tell your crew what you're working on ask for feedback like remember it's coming from their perspective which sometimes you have to be a bit of a private eye to figure out what they're telling you or how it really applies to what you can do to change like i would get this feedback sometimes i'd be like "Ooh, okay i don't even really know so I had to ask better questions of my crew. So ask good questions so that you get good feedback. Um, get out in the rough stuff. Like just as rough as you can get, just get out there in the warm water, in the warm weather, just make yourself, challenge yourself, challenge your, 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 your crew to get out into the rougher water. Um, <clears throat> head to head. Oh my gosh, you guys, if you have the ability in a, in a club, to go 
head to head with your training, it's like you're racing every time. It is gold. It's gold. So go head to head with crews when you can, with your similar speed. Make sure that you're close. Practice turns. That allows you as a steersman to try different things and see how it affects your boat speed relative to someone else. So if you have the ability to go head to head as a training program, that will vault you miles ahead because essentially what you're doing is you're, you're training every day like it's a race. And you, everyone knows you learn way more in a race situation than you do in a training situation because it's just so much more relaxed in a training situation. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so this is a good one. This will teach you uh, how effective you are at your paddle steering. Is that for four hut hose, four hut hose, only paddle steer. And then for four hut hose, poke. And for four hut hose, paddle steer. So you go from one skill to the other, and you're going to see, see pretty quickly how ineffective your paddling st steering strokes are. That kind of spoke to what Cindy was talking about. Be careful when you use your paddling strokes to steer because I'm gonna tell you, almost all of you guys, they're gonna be ineffective, even in the unlimited, even in the unlimited. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is one to graduate yourself up from poke, twist, pull, is that you can't steer for four strokes. So paddle, 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 paddle. No matter where the canoe is going, you have to get it back online. So that means sometimes you're gonna to have to have a really aggressive stroke to get it back online. You're gonna to have to have a pretty patient crew to go from four strokes to five strokes to six strokes, to seven strokes, and then keep building it up. Because what happens is it's teaching you how to get a canoe back on course with the least amount of effort. And my personal favorites, six times 10 minutes. Six times 10 minutes is a workout. And every single 10 minutes, everyone is switching seats. So six seat, no, one seat goes back to six seat and everyone moves up. So everybody in the canoe is sitting in every seat and everyone in the canoe is steering. As a steersman, you're gonna get thanked a lot afterwards. <laughs> because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of this going on. And then for the next week, you'd be like, thanks, thanks, Cheryl. Thanks for steering. You did such a great job, Cheryl. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's how those goes. Plus, um, it's, it's a really good way to identify natural steering ability. Because as a program, I don't do, I don't do beginning steering clinics. Um, I think Lori might actually, Lori Velesic might do some, but I definitely don't. I think that that's a club based program requirement. And that is, is that you have to identify beginner steersmen. You have to get them in the boat. You have to get them to the point where they could race a race. And then, um, then they could probably go to a clinic. Um, but this is a great way of identifying uh, talent because those people who can jump in the back and kind of keep the boat straight, that's a good place to start for them. And the guys that go like this, and I'm saying guys, guys and gals, you know, you know what I mean. If they're like this, like write them off. That don't even bother, you know, and they might be going, oh, I just want to get really good at this skill. Like, no, you are not a prodigy. Don't, you don't even, you don't even need to go there. And it's okay. It's okay, you guys. If you're making this happen, it's okay. I kind of feel like at times I feel like I wish I'd done that at the beginning. I wish I had just made myself go like this. So I never had to steer because I have this love hate relationship with steering, but I'm here I am three, five years uh, later. Um, okay. Get in as many boats as you can to steer. I started steering the first year I paddled, I paddled dragon boat. I paddled marathon. I paddled uh, sprint kayaks. I paddled outrigger. I gorged gorged on paddling and it made me a better paddler and i'm going to do a shout out here to people like rob varnell judy chandler um jeanette callahan up in whistler i don't know if she's paddling anymore on the pemberton side but these guys all came from marathon backgrounds and i'll tell you the reason why they are so solid in the back of the boat is that they've paddled so many different kinds of canoes that 
um, that those skills are transferable. Put yourself in a marathon canoe. It is humbling. It is absolutely humbling. Put yourself in a V1. Absolutely humbling. Leanne Stanley, she came to us in Sacramento and she was a C1 paddler, a marathon paddler. And she could make that V1 hump because she knew how to steer it. And uh, so put yourself, get yourself out of the comfort zone. Put yourself in these different crafts that are available and just learn how they move. And it'll make you a better steersman. Seek out expertise. Um, but you guys, let's be smart about this because I think that you'd be surprised how much expertise you have in your own club. We all think that you have to be from Tahiti to be able to be listened to or Hawaii or wherever. You know, we have to have won some big race before you're, you're willing to listen to anyone. Um, but you'd be amazed how much talent and skill is right in your backyard. Don't, don't ignore that, even in your own crew. You know, like I can get in and I do these steering clinics and I learn a lot. I learn a lot about my communication. I learn about those things that I've taken for granted because I've never really had to think about for a long time. And now I'm watching people think about it. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I think I'm getting a bit complacent on that. And so I'm always learning, always, always, always learning. Um, okay, so the last thing we've got before we head out is race prep. Um, I'll package all those drills up and um, send them off to you. Do a little bit more explaining so that they're not so uh, um, confusing. Uh, so race prep. <laughs> okay, so here's my, here's my byline. How best to avoid those sphincter tightening moments. <laughs> As a steersman, I'll tell you, my palms get sweaty when I think about the start line. Like, look, okay, we're gonna leave this one up for a bit. Like you guys, I can sit and stare at that and I start to get anxiety. Look at that start line. Look at it. It's intense, it's strong. I mean, stuff can go wrong. My worst start ever was at a Catalina race. And we, I did, we just got in this biggest log jam. It was absolutely terrible. And it was my first experience in a log jam. And I was realized that, holy smokes, there was just nothing I could do. There was nothing as a steersman I could do to help my crew out of it. We just had to stop and wait for it all to dissipate. So if you're looking at this picture, stare at this picture. And what I'm gonna say to you, remember my voice in this picture, hold your line, hold your line as a steersman. The most important thing that you do on the start is hold your line. It doesn't matter if you wanna go right, hold your line until you're clear. And then everyone gets out of this mess safely. And if you are trying to be a paddler first and a steersman second, you will not be holding your line, I guarantee it. In this mess, you are a steersman first and foremost. And if that means all you do is rudder to get yourself out of there. Leanne will attest. What do I say on the start line, Leanne? Get me the hell out of here, girls. <laughs> get There's me usually out. A, usually Give a four-letter word in there, but yeah, it's get out of there. Yeah, <laughs> there might I might escalate the word, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, before you get on the start line, talk to your crew. Ask, tell them what you expect from them on the line and what they can expect from you. Uh, <clears throat> this has to go with really how you, how you line up, but how much help you need to keep the boat straight, um, uh, keep the boat on the line. I mean, here's, this is Hamilton Island. Our crew is number 53, the one Fern, the Fernwood boat, the second one from the front here. Um, but look at the depth of that race. Okay. So this was the change race. It's men and women and mixed all race together. They all start together. Uh, we happened to decide in this particular race to come way over to this side so that we could get clear water. <clears throat> but a lot of the times, you guys, we would line up behind our men's crew. So in years, we would decide our men's crew were really fast. We lined up behind our men's crew. So we were in the second row of the start, but we were always in clean water really fast because we knew we could trust these guys. They got out of the shot really fast. We kind of got in their wash and we would take off. I did that this year at Island Iron, actually. I wanted a start spot for my uh, Sirski and I just went to the second row and I 
I got in the second row. So don't be afraid to think outside of the box here. Not to say that you want to go to the second row, but in those big races where you're not really sure how many Gumbies are around you. I mean, I'm using that word, but it's, it, you just don't know what you don't know about the steersman around you really. So um, it can make or break your race. You could train a whole year, spend all your vacation and all your money only to have it ruined in the first 10 seconds because someone, someone's armor runs over you or you, your armor runs over somebody else because they spun you out and you flip, flipped your boat. So hold your line, know what your crew can expect from you and what you expect from your crew. Um, know that the only way you can steer, your crew has to know the only way it can steer is by momentum. So they can't stop paddling. They have to be paddling for you to be able to steer. <laughs> However, there are times and there's only one time where they have to stop paddling and that is in a log jam. And when you're in a log jam, no amount of paddling is gonna help. It's just gonna make it worse. So that's the only time that you, you stop. Um, and then I guess the magic is, and having raced from the, from the front for most of my career, I was had the fortunate, the fortunate situation of having some very, very fast crews. And so I found a lot of comfort in racing from the front, but I also know that I cannot trust the lead boat at all. I got to know my course, know your course. Um, I have had some, lots of experience as well now that um, I've raced in multidiscipline races where you have men and mixed races is that racing in a pack is super fun because you can let everyone make the mistakes ahead of you and then you can capitalize on those mistakes. So know your course, um, pretty, and hold your line. <laughs> Hold your line. Hold your line on the start. Put that pitcher back up. Get us all sweaty again. <laughs> Hold your line on the start. You need to have your steer strokes down in order to do that, you guys. You need to be absolutely nailed with those things. Look at that. It's stress inducing. And, and that includes when you're, you're waiting on the start line, too. That includes when you're waiting on the start line, too. Okay, so I mean, I guess in closing, what I can say is um, the, be the, the way to become a better sport is after a dog who couldn't swim fell into and, the water. Uh, a Philippine tells us it was a team oh, I, effort. I got a little bit of a noise. Oh, there we go. Um, the way to get better at steering is to steer. It's like the way to get better at riding your bike is to ride your bike. The way to get better at uh, lifting weights is to lift weights. The way to get better at steering is to steer. And it's a love-hate relationship. And it means that, you know, in any condition, at any time, with any crew, you're sitting in that seat. But treat it as a learning experience and know that um, you will learn in this job for the rest of your life. <laughs> I continue to learn. And it's what I love and it's what I hate about it. But it's something that just is in my soul. And it's been attracted to you my whole time. So thank you, everybody. I uh, hope to see you on the water. And um, I don't know, we've got five minutes, so we might have a few questions, but. Yeah, if uh, anyone's Cheryl, got any questions. Yeah, Cheryl, I'm gonna take the spotlight off you now. So we're gonna see, it's gonna look like Hollywood Squares again. Uh, but, uh, so if anyone, uh, there's lots of thank yous uh, pouring in and just a reminder that there will be video and uh, narrative uh, attached to the website, but uh, I think we'll hand it off to Rowan. Uh, to uh, thank Cheryl for a fantastic presentation and uh, see if there are any last minute questions. So Ron, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, thanks a lot, Cheryl. That was that was fantastic. That's it's really nice to be able to uh, take advantage of your experience. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming in. I just see lots of thank yous. Uh, I think we had some questions when 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 the uh, session. Oh, Chris has got another question. Chris. I was just interested in your uh, thoughts about posting, like when when it's appropriate. To post? Yeah. Post oh, static draw. Stroke, that good stroke that I hate, that one? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, the only time I ever do it is when I'm in trouble. And, and usually that means that I've now, um, I'm now spinning. The canoe is spinning 
the AMA is high. Uh, I have a five seat that doesn't know what they're doing. And I am very vulnerable if I plant a very strong right hand um, steer stroke. So what I'll do is I'll do a big post, a big goon stroke to just control, to just try and find some control of that AMA. And once that arm is in control and it's down and it's not such in a vulnerable spot, then I'll go back to the Pope. But I, I very, I, it's, a, it's a super rare time that I would ever use that. And it's usually when I'm in deep trouble. Thanks. And uh, Gus just reminded me or reminded us that um, I think uh, Kim had a question regarding currents and you know, what, oh, yeah. when, when do you sort of just, uh, you know, let the current take the boat uh, yeah. versus fighting it? Yeah. I mean, we have the, we have the opportunity at Comox to paddle in the river. And so as a result, we sort of learned how to ferry the river and all kind of things. But I'll tell you my very, my, I told you that I spent most of my time trying to teach myself and I had to do it by being told everything that I was wrong by my crew for many years, but it wasn't until Rick knew showed up and this was his very first steering um, coaching tip that he gave me and he says Cheryl, because we have so much current in BC. When you're heading towards your mark for the turn. Remember that no matter how the current is pushing you it's going to look like you're still aiming for that mark. But he goes, it's not until you turn around and you see where you've come from that you can see the effect that current has had on you. So he says, when you're heading into a current zone, turn around and mark yourself behind so that as you're heading into the current and as the current starts to sweep you, you can turn around and do a quick reminder of yourself. You're like, holy crap, I'm way off course here. And then you can adjust what you're doing. You know, this is something that we had to do, I had to do because I, like I said, I, I got, I had the opportunity, the privilege of racing a lot from the front. So I never got to see the mistakes. Everyone else was watching me and us and seeing that we were swinging around and they could adjust for that, right? But that, that was one of the nicest and best tips that I, and super excited because for the first time I had a coach who actually knew how to coach steering. So that was fun. Hey, we had one question from Jennifer. Um, do you have any steering clinics planned in the future? Oh, no, I don't. Um, I don't actually. Jackie Weber, um, lovely Jackie Weber, was, uh, we teamed up a lot for many years and we would usually do one in the spring and one in the fall um, out of Falls Creek. And we just haven't done that for a long time. Since I moved to the island, I, we really haven't done that. Um, I don't, I don't have any plans. Um, but, you know, give me a call. I'm, I'm always open to it. I, I do feel like you guys, there's so much talent um, out there within your own club. You're going to be amazed if you dig into your own club, how much talent you've got. And um, these kind of things are awesome. And uh, yeah, just, but I'm, I'm always open for an adventure. And um, like, if, you know, if you're interested in steering within your club, you know, ask around within your club, you know, you, you've got, You've got you probably have different levels of programs, and and, uh, and and paddlers in other programs, you know, might be receptive to uh, having you learn it with with them. You know, if you're, you know, if you're with a, you know, a very competitive crew that, you know, where you won't wouldn't be able to get uh, any time in seat six without pissing a lot of people off. <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there's, 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 you know, you can probably get some experience somewhere else in your club temporarily. Jump, you know, jump in another boat. And then mm -hmm. jump, you know, come back and so forth. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say, you guys, is that as a paddler, as a steersman, I always really try to make my crew. Um, and I mean that by um, I, I would always try and be the top six in, in the time trials. And so um, that meant a lot of the times I had to do a lot of extra work or I had to go and paddle with other programs and um, be a paddler and not just a steersman because in the steering seat let's face it you you sacrifice yourself quite often and it's not easy to get as strong and as as fit as everybody else who's just dedicating themselves 100% to paddling so um, as a steersman um, um, I think that 
it's competitive enough now in Canada that uh, in order to be a steering a top crew, you have to have been able to make the top crew too. So mm -hmm. uh, it really speaks to that point of just moving around and, 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 and challenging yourself in lots of ways. That's right. Uh, Eric posted uh, a note that uh, you should urge your own club to maybe host a steering clinic. I'd just like to remind people that Cora does offer uh, a clinic grant to member clubs of up to $600. And um, the one proviso is, is that the clinic cannot make a profit uh, and it's got to be open to all Cora members. But, um, you know, if you're hosting, a, if your club wants to host a clinic, you know, you've got up to 600 bucks available uh, from, from a Cora grant. I, I'm not sure what the total budget allocation is for that, um, but, you know, uh, the uh, details are available on the Cora website under grants, so yeah. So, you know, you can, you can make that happen within your club as well. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks very much, Cheryl. I think, thanks, do, everybody. Any other questions? Okay, I think that's about it. Thanks very much. Uh, just a note to everybody uh, uh, on the call, uh, we will have another session in February. We're not sure what the topic will be, but if you've got any suggestions, you can email us and uh, we'll consider it. And thanks again. Thanks again, Cheryl. It's been, this has been great. Yeah. And thanks, uh, guys. it's yeah. good to get fired up for the season. Yeah, it is. As everyone's moving back to OC6. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have some OC6 races this year. So good. All, All right. right. See you so much for nationals. Yes, indeed. That's right. That's right, everybody. Coma, uh, nationals will be in Comox this year. So in September. In September. Yeah. That's right. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Go have dinner, everybody. Put your feet up and relax and practice your steering strokes. Bye for now. <laughs>